practitioner of Dzogchen and meditation must have precise presence and awareness. Until one really and truly knows one's own mind and can govern it with awareness, even if very many explanations of reality are given, they remain nothing more than ink on paper or matters for debate among intellectuals without the possibility of the birth of any understanding of the real meaning. It is said, the mind is that which creates both samsara and nirvana. So one needs to know this king which creates everything. We say we transmigrate in the impure and illusory vision of samsara. But in reality, it's just our mind that is transmigrating. And then again, as far as pure enlightenment is concerned, it's only our own mind purified, that realizes it. Our mind is the basis of everything, and from our mind Everything arises, samsara and nirvana. Ordinary sentient beings and enlightened ones. Consider the way beings transmigrate in the impure vision of samsara even though the essence of the mind, the true nature of our mind, is totally pure right from the beginning. Nevertheless, because pure mind is temporarily obscured by the impurity of ignorance, there is no self-recognition of our own state. Through this lack of self-recognition arise illusory thoughts and actions created by the passions. Thus various negative karmic causes are accumulated. And since their maturation as effects is inevitable, one suffers bitterly transmigrating in the six states of existence. Thus, not recognizing one's own state is the cause of transmigration. And through this cause, one becomes a slave of illusions and distractions. Conditioned by the mind, one becomes strongly habituated to illusory actions.
and then it's the same as far as pure enlightenment is concerned. Beyond one's own mind, there is no dazzling light to come shining in from outside to wake one up. If one recognizes one's own intrinsic state as pure from the very beginning and only temporarily obscured by impurities, and if one maintains the presence of this recognition without becoming distracted, then all the impurities dissolve. This is the essence of the path. Then the inherent quality of the great original purity of the primordial state manifests and one recognizes it and becomes the master of it as a lived experience. This experience of the real knowledge of the authentic original condition or the true awareness of the state is what is called Nirvana. So enlightenment is nothing other than one's own mind in its purified condition. For this reason, Padmasambhava said, the mind is the creator of samsara and of nirvana. Outside the mind, there exists neither samsara nor nirvana. Having thus established that the basis of samsara and nirvana is the mind, it follows that all that seems concrete in the world and all the seeming solidity of beings themselves is nothing but an illusory vision of one's own mind. Just as a person who has a bile disease sees a shell as being yellow, even if one can see objectively that it is not its true colour. So in just the same way, as a result of the particular karmic causes of sentient beings, the various illusory visions manifest. Thus, if one were to meet a being of each of the six states of existence on the bank of the same river, they would not see that river in the same way, since they would each have different karmic causes. The beings of the hot hells would see the river as fire, those of the cold hells would see it as ice. Beings of the hungry ghost realm would see the river as blood and pus. Aquatic animals would see it as an environment to live in. Human beings would see the river as water to drink, while the demigods would see it as weapons and the gods as nectar. This shows that in reality, nothing exists as concrete and objective. Therefore, 
understanding that the root of samsara is truly the mind. One should set out to pull up the root. Recognizing that the mind itself is the essence of enlightenment, one attains liberation. Thus, being aware that the basis of samsara and nirvana is only the mind, one takes the decision to practice. At this point, with mindfulness and determination, it is necessary to maintain a continuous present awareness without becoming distracted. If, for example, one wants to stop a river from flowing. One must block it at its source in such a way that its flow is definitively interrupted. Whatever other point you may choose to block it at, you will not obtain the same result. Likewise, if we want to cut the root of samsara, we must cut the root of the mind that has created it. Otherwise, there would be no way of becoming free of samsara. If we want all the suffering and hindrances arising from our negative actions to dissolve, we must cut the root of the mind which produced them. If we don't do this, even if we carry out virtuous actions with our body and voice, there will be no result beyond a momentary fleeting benefit. In addition, never having cut the root of negative actions, they can once again be newly accumulated in just the same way that if one only lops off a few leaves and branches from a tree instead of cutting its main root. It will without doubt grow once again. If the mind, the king that creates everything, is not left in its natural condition, even if one practices the tantric methods of the different stages and recites many mantras, one is not on the path to total liberation. This is why non-distraction is the root of the paths and the fundamental principle of the practice. It was by following this supreme path of continuous presence that all the Buddhas of the past became enlightened. By following this same path, the Buddhas of the future will become enlightened and the Buddhas of the present following this right path, are enlightened. Without following this path, it is not possible to attain enlightenment.
Therefore, because the continuation in the presence of the true state is the essence of all the paths, the root of all meditations, the conclusion of all spiritual practices, the juice of all esoteric methods, the heart of all ultimate teachings. It is necessary to seek to maintain a continuous presence without becoming distracted. What this means is, don't follow the past, don't anticipate the future, and don't follow illusory thoughts that arise in the present. But turning within oneself, one should observe one's own true condition and maintain the awareness of it just as it is. Beyond conceptual limitations of the three times. One must remain in the uncorrected condition of one's own natural state, free from the impurity of judgments between being and non-being, having and not having, good and bad, and so on. The original condition of the great perfection is truly beyond the limited conceptions of the three times. But those who are just beginning the practice do not yet have this awareness and find it difficult to experience the recognition of their own state. It is therefore very important not to allow oneself to be distracted by the thoughts of the three times. If, in order not to become distracted, one tries to eliminate all one's thoughts, becoming fixated on the search for a state of calm or a sensation of pleasure, it is necessary to remember that this is an error in that the very fixation one is engaged in is in itself nothing but another thought. One should relax the mind maintaining only the awakened presence of one's own state without allowing oneself to be dominated by any thought whatsoever. When one is truly relaxed, the mind finds itself in its natural condition. If, out of this natural condition, thoughts arise, whether good or bad, rather than trying to judge whether one is in the calm state or in the wave of thoughts, one should just acknowledge all thoughts with the awakened presence of the state itself. When thoughts are given just this bare attention of simple acknowledgement, they relax into their own true condition. And as long as this awareness of their relaxedness lasts, one should not forget to keep the mind present. 
if one becomes distracted and does not simply acknowledge the thoughts, then it is necessary to give more attention to making one's awareness truly present. If one finds that thoughts arise about finding oneself in a state of calm, without abandoning simple presence of mind, one should continue by observing the state of movement of the thought itself. In the same way, if no thoughts arise, one should continue with the presence of the simple acknowledgement that just gives bare attention to the state of calm. This means maintaining the presence of this natural state without attempting to fix it within any conceptual framework or hoping for it to manifest in any particular form, colour or light, but just relaxing into it in a condition undisturbed by the characteristics or the ramifications of thought. Even if those who begin to practice this find it difficult to continue in this state for more than an instant, there is no need to worry about it. Without wishing for the state to continue for a long time and without fearing the lack of it altogether, all that is necessary is to maintain pure presence of mind without falling into the dualistic situation of there being an observing subject perceiving an observed object. If the mind, even though one maintains simple presence, does not remain in this calm state, but always tends to follow waves of thoughts about the past or the future, or becomes distracted by the aggregates of the senses, such as sight, hearing, and so on. Then one should try to understand that the wave of thought itself is as insubstantial as the wind. If one tries to catch the wind, one does not succeed. Likewise, if one tries to block the wave of thought, it cannot be cut off. So for this reason, one should not try to block thought much less try to renounce it as something considered negative. In reality, the calm state is the essential condition of mind, while the wave of thought is the mind's natural clarity in function. just as there is no distinction whatever between the sun and its rays, or a stream and its ripples. So there is no distinction between the mind and thought. If one considers the calm state as something positive to be attained, and the wave of thought is something negative to be abandoned. And one remains thus caught up in the duality of accepting 
and rejecting. There is no way of overcoming the ordinary state of mind. Therefore, the essential principle is to acknowledge with bare attention without letting oneself become distracted. Whatever thought arises, be it good or bad, important or less important, and to continue to maintain presence in the state of the moving wave of thought itself. When a thought arises, and one does not succeed in remaining calm with his presence, since other such thoughts may follow, it is necessary to be skillful in acknowledging it with non-distraction. Acknowledging does not mean seeing it with one's eyes or forming a concept about it, Rather, it means giving bare attention, without distraction, to whatever thought of the three times, or whatever perception of the senses may arise, and thus being fully conscious of this wave, while continuing in the presence of the pure awareness.